I believe the hard left turn the country is currently taking is the reason for all the violence making our main streets some of the deadliest places in America. But it wasn't always that way. The rioting, looting, destroying our businesses, assaults, and even death are a byproduct of Democrat rule. Allow me to connect the dots. The left believes they are right and we conservatives are simply wrong. But not only are we wrong, we aren't woke. In order to add octane to that, the liberal left defines not woke as racist or bigoted. So in essence, if you don't agree with the radical left, you must be intolerant or worse. So rather than be branded as something awful, we acquiesce, we cower, and we hide, hoping it just all goes away. But it doesn't go away. It gets bigger and badder. Next, they take to the streets and protest. But what they're really doing is rioting and looting and breaking the law. And anyone who calls attention to the riots gets attacked by the woke mob. Defund the police is the battle cry. And they claim it's because they say cops are biased. What they really mean is, Defund the police so we can riot anytime we feel aggrieved. Now, add in the fact that they're also trying to make it harder and harder to buy a gun to defend ourselves, and we have the makings of anarchy. A ticking time bomb of anxiety and frustration ready to explode on Main Street, USA. But you get the cycle? Sadly, it will continue to roll like a snowball, getting bigger and more violent until someone stands up to the mob. So far, standing up to the mob, it ain't happening. Nowhere in America has this played out in a bigger way than in the great Northwest, Seattle and Portland, two of America's most beautiful and livable cities, up until recently, that is. The woke mob with cover provided by the liberal left took hold of those two great American cities last summer. And now, a year later, the mob is still at it, destroying the American dream one street at a time. Tonight, our focus is on Seattle, and Portland. In Seattle, even answering your own front door is taking your life into your own hands. Just this past weekend, a 16-year-old Earl Estrella was shot and killed answering a knock at his own front door. Police say it happened just before 11 p.m. There's no word on the suspect or any motives thus far. But that's just par for the course in Seattle 2021. Despite the COVID lockdown, last year was the deadliest year in Seattle in 26 years. There were 52 homicides, up more than 48% from 2019, and we seem to be on the same track this year. One of the epicenters of last year's violence was CHAZ. Remember that? The Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone that was established in the wake of the George Floyd death. For more than a month, there were nightly riots, sexual assaults, and even shootings in that four-block area, which police were not allowed to enter. Now, think of that for a second. Police not allowed to enter. That's a recipe for disaster, and that's exactly what Seattle has been. That beautiful, shining city on the hill, a burning hellscape at times. One of those victims was 19-year-old Loretto Anderson, who succumbed to injuries from a gunshot wound after police and other from treating him. Now, Lorenzo's mother has filed a lawsuit against the city claiming that officials created the dangerous environment that led to her son's death. Why was the CHOP even present without security? Why would we have this type of event and we would evacuate our precinct? I mean, so what was that about? What was that environment set up for? Just heartbreaking. But just a thought, perhaps Mrs. Anderson should add Antifa to that lawsuit. After all, weren't they the ones preventing first responders to first respond? P.S. Mrs. Anderson, we pray for you and your family's loss. Lorenzo should not have died that night. That's just one of several suits the city is facing after Mayor Jenny Durkin followed the autonomous zone to exist, allowed it to exist for more than a month. Meanwhile, just this Wednesday, Seattle police arrested a 43-year-old man after he allegedly left a voicemail threatening to kill Mayor Durkin. Mean streets, folks. These are mean streets. 
Speaking of threats, just to the south, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler is finding out the hard way that you can't appease the leftist mob. The type of violence and riots found in Seattle's autonomous zone happened almost nightly in Portland, going all the way back to last summer. So, for more than a year now, Portland has been under siege from the leftist mob. Now, don't forget, Mayor Wheeler refused President Trump's offer of the National Guard to help stop the violence Antifa was perpetrating on Portland. After more than a year, Wheeler finally got a backbone. I've directed the police bureau to arrest people engaged in legal activity whenever they can safely do so tonight to prevent and limit further destruction. Together, we can make a stand. We're doing what we can today. I'm also asking for your help to make a stand and take our city back. Okay, but that's a far cry from when Mayor Wheeler said this at an Antifa BLM rally last July. First of all, I want to thank the tens of thousands of Portlanders who've come out to demonstrate in support of racial justice and equity. I want to thank the thousands of you who've come out to oppose the Trump administration's occupation of our city. But now the FBI is investigating an Antifa death threat made against Mayor Wheeler Wednesday night. Ted, we are asking for the last time that you resign. If you ignore this message outright, the destruction to your precious way of life is going to escalate. Blood is already on your hands, Ted. But next time, it may just be your own. This is scary stuff, folks. And guess what? It got the attention of Mayor Wheeler. Nothing like the mob coming after you, Mr. Mayor, to change your tune. You know, it's easy to see why Mayor Wheeler is singing a different tune now that the mob has targeted him. I think he's realizing that no amount of defunding the police will appease Antifa or the various mobs ruling Seattle and Portland. But it may be too late to put that genie back in the bottle. Take a look what happens here during the average day in Portland. This is after folks on the ground say that 25 people temporarily occupied, occupied, get that, an intersection calling for the abolition of police. And this is what happened to a man yesterday who was just trying to drive around the peaceful protests. That's what these once great cities, Seattle and Portland, look like when the radical left is allowed to run wild. They're now in chief of strongholds. We have to stand up to the left. Turn the country is making it times it will be hard. We may be called names. We may lose friends. We may even lose our jobs. But if we don't stand up to these radicals, we may lose something far more valuable. We may lose law and order in our streets, in our schools, and in our neighborhoods. A fate far worse. But hey, that's just my opinion, my conservative opinion. Our correspondent, James Klug, has a ground-level look at the hard truth in Seattle and Portland. Seattle became one of the first major cities to reimagine policing. People and business owners have been fleeing in droves from what was once the crown jewel of the Pacific Northwest. No less than 160 businesses have left Seattle since last March, many of them citing the threat of more violence and inept city leadership. Local residents expressed fear of even leaving their homes. Meanwhile, Antifa, an anarcho-communist movement, has established a major foothold in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in Seattle and Portland, as city officials have largely enabled their behavior with lax public policy, like the DA's revolving door approach to most violent protesters and lack of support for local police. Antifa wants the abolition of any governmental leadership, and they know they can't accomplish this goal through peaceful means. They believe riots, window smashing, and business burning are necessary to establish their totalitarian utopia. They've caused millions of dollars in property damage, assaulted hundreds of police officers, and there's no end in sight. In Portland, police turnover is the highest seen in 15 years, with at least 115 officers having retired or quit since July of last year. 
Seattle is feeling the effects of cop burnout too, with over 180 officers leaving in 2020, a record high. The Seattle Police Department says it's currently in a staffing crisis since 66 more officers have called it quits so far this year. Although a great many living in these two cities oppose the violence, others don't seem to mind and believe rioters are taking a stand against injustice. You know, like if it takes throwing fireworks at f***ing policemen, like it has to happen. I don't know if it's accurate reporting that it's violent. There was a shooting of a Trump supporter recently. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Tough luck. Don't be a f***ing Trump supporter in Portland. Ultimately, if the citizens of Seattle and Portland want to put an end to residential and business flight and ensure the peace and tranquility they were once celebrated for, they'll have to elect different leaders and begin moving in a direction yet to be seen. Reporting for Newsmax, I'm James Klug. Hey, I'm Rob Finnerty. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe too. Hit the bell icon to be alerted to breaking news. And remember, there's a whole lot more on Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news network. Newsmax TV, where real news for real people.